The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents a debate review. How do we resolve the conflict between LGBTQ rights and religious liberties? Hi, so this is a debate review for a debate that I posted last month. There'll be a link down there. It's part of this channel. It's part of the Atheist Debates Patreon Project as well. And it's a debate that I did with the Bible and Beer Consortium who I've worked with many, many times before and will continue to work with. Uh, Ezra Boggs, the director of the Bible and Beer Consortium, is a friend of mine. We have a good working relationship. He manages to find debate opponents and venues. And he reached out to me and said, hey, we'd like to do Bible and Beer Consortium in Austin, you know, to expand this. And this was actually quite some time ago. And it proved to be kind of difficult to find a venue, find a time, or get everybody's schedules together. Um, and ultimately we ended up having a discussion about, okay, when are we going to do this? And it kept getting postponed, uh, around early March, I think it was February, March timeframe, uh, Ezra asked if I wanted to, to go ahead and get this debate thing started here in Austin. And I said, yes, but of course I had a lot going on. I had a friend of mine in a coma at the time and, uh, people visiting from out of town and I wasn't sure when we were going to do it. But also the, the suggested topics uh, as they came in were not topics that I thought were going to be particularly good for a debate. Uh, there was a lot of it sent, seemed to center around LGBTQ rights, um, you know, the birthday cake uh, issues and uh, bathroom usage or something like that is how the topics felt. It's not what the topics literally were. It's not like he said, hey, let's debate whether or not who can use what bathroom. But that's how they felt to me. And there was also a concern um, when addressing the optics of this. I've debated abortion before, and it was me, a cis male, against a cis female, both of us atheists, but she was very much uh, opposed to abortion rights and access, and I was very much in favor. And there's a potential optics issue there of, well, how does it look to have a man um, arguing on behalf of abortion? And how does it look to have a straight cis white guy arguing on behalf of LGBT rights? Uh, I understand the optics issues. I talked to quite a few people about it. I talked to several people about it when I did the abortion debate, you know, should I be doing this? And while there's always going to be optics issues, the general consensus uh, amongst the people I, I talked to was that yeah, this is an okay thing to do. Maybe you shouldn't make it your life's work to be running around being the guy championing abortion. But if you make good arguments and you debate well uh, and you represent the people uh, that you're there for, this isn't anything different than, you know, picking a decent lawyer to represent you in court. And, but I'm, I'm, I try to always be aware of that. And so there were some concerns about stepping into a debate on LGBT rights where you've got to cis straight guys. Um, the bigger issue, of course, is are the parties being represented well and fairly? And if you wanted to have a debate and you have your group of people who are potentially going to draw in an, an audience and you can treat the subject fairly, then I don't see too much of an issue doing it. But when we talked about the topics, uh, the topic for the debate, I wanted to make sure that w we were setting something up so that we could be as clear as possible that this was about education this was about um, making the public aware that your sincerely held religious convictions while you have a right to hold those your right to, to exercise and take action on behalf of those convictions is limited by other people's rights as well now one of the things that keeps coming up is well you know, I, I should have this right versus I do have this right. And a right is useless if it's not actually protected. If you, if there's not a, if you live in a, in a country that does not protect your right, you don't have it. You can argue that you should have that right. You can argue that right needs to be protected and that this is, you could say this is a basic human right, or this is consistent with the way other countries do it or the United Nations do it, or just general thoughts on, uh, liberty and freedom dictate that we should be doing this and we're currently doing it wrong. All of those things are things you can debate, but you don't have the right until it's actually protected. It's useless to say, uh, I have a right to X 
if there's no guarantee or protection of that. And as a matter of fact, there may actually be prohibitions against the thing that you're claiming that you do have a right to. And it's because we discuss things in different contexts. One is about the context of the way things should be, and one is about the context of the way things are. And there are also people who are concerned because, um, well, my right to exist shouldn't be up for debate. Well, first of all, everything is potentially debatable. This is about changing minds. This isn't about what is or what you should have. Uh, and at no point were we truly getting anywhere near somebody's right to exist, although I completely understand uh, that when you view things as my existence requires these basic rights, anything that comes close to um, suggesting you, sh you should not have those rights seems like an attack on your existence and in some context is. But I wanted to make sure that when we talked about this in the, in, in the debate, that it, we stayed away from the specifics on individual rights and freedoms and instead talked about the conflict because there are, there's a massive group of people who feel that their religious liberty should have primacy, as we saw in the debate. As my opponent presented, um, oh, well, they listed, you know, the religious protection first, which means it's the most important. No, I mean, that's, a, that's an unfounded assertion. When we have these rights, they're roughly equal until they come in conflict. And then, they, and then you have to figure out, okay, how do we resolve the conflict between these rights? And for the, for the, on the issue when I say everything's debatable, when we're talking about changing minds, there are only a couple of possibilities. Either you exercise power to force people to act in accordance with what you want, whether you change their mind or not, you reach some level of compromise, or you stand by um, a particular set of rights and make a convincing and compelling argument in the hopes of changing someone else's mind. And people's minds do change. My mind has changed on many subjects. The people who watch the show who found their way out of religion or found their way to skepticism or found their way free of superstition or found their way in support of LGBTQ rights when they didn't used to hold those positions were convinced by argument and evidence. Now, this is not just an academic exercise. This is a process of building a case to fundamentally change the world. So we talked about it. And we set up the debate with this particular topic so that I could make some of those points and we could have this discussion. And I want to find out where my opponent was on this and also where the audience members were. And if you go and watch the debate and listen to the questions, uh, I hope you'll find that this was both worthwhile in the sense that it exposed people who hadn't heard certain things to that information and hopefully being published online exposes more people to that information. Because my views in support of the LGBT community uh, don't come from me being a part of that community. Now, there are people who would say, well, you know, you're the straight cis guy, you shouldn't be out there defending that, leave that to the folks who are actually part of the affected classes. I mean, let somebody in the LGBT community actually defend that. Uh, and that's a good idea, and it's something that I'm happy to do. But if I'm asked to do a debate, and I'm the person that they want for the debate, then I, my job is to go in and d defend what is right, to defend the basics of humanism, to go in and defend LGBT rights as best as I can. And so I reach out to some of my friends uh, who are in the community, talk to them, get their advice and opinions, and try to prepare for what my opponent's going to say. And if you go look at the comments uh, for the YouTube video for that particular debate, what you'll see is a number of people who said, you know, Matt's opponent, their opening remarks sounded eminently reasonable right up to the point where Matt started talking and exposing what the problems were. Because what happened is, I mentioned the three ways you're going to change things, the persuasion, power, or compromise, because I hadn't come up with a third P word for that one yet. He went with compromise. His view was like, look, can't we just, you know, if there's a pharmacist who doesn't want to dispense somebody's uh, contraceptive stuff or their, their medication that they need for transitioning, can't we just, you know, have another pharmacist that works there uh, 
go ahead and dispense that stuff so that we're not forcing people to violate their religion. And, and if you wanted a cake and this, the baker won't make a cake, can't we just let people go to another cake? Uh, the easiest response to this, which is what I addressed during the debate, is that this is coming from a place of immense privilege and is usually something you know, offered up by folks who live in the city. Uh, because you might live in a small town where there's one bakery, where there's one pharmacy, where they, you may have a pharmacy that's so small, you can't, so small that you can't afford to hire uh, additional people in order to accommodate people's religious privilege. And at the end of the day, you have a job to do. And if your religion prevents you from doing that job to the extent that the law would and should require, then you don't get to do that job. Uh, some of the discussions after the debate were over kept going back to the to the cake thing and there was a gentleman that came up to say well you know don't you think that the, the, making a cake uh, a custom cake uh, is, is art and I said well I sure I could look at it as art well do you think the government can compel someone to do art no I don't there you just lost you just <laughs> it was so funny because he was so excited as if that was a gotcha Yes, I think the government should not be able to compel someone to do art, but that's not what we're talking about in the case of this bakery uh, thing. Like, nobody's, nobody's saying he should be required to make them a cake. What they're saying is, if he wants to keep his business license and be open to the public, he should be required to make them a cake. At the end of the day, he doesn't have to make them a cake, and if he doesn't, he shouldn't be making anybody cakes. That's the way it works with the law. We've solved most of these problems before. The the course points that were addressed in the in, in this debate uh, have been resolved for ages. It's the finer points that, that we really needed to get to. And we can't do that until people begin to grasp these things. During the Q&A, there was also someone who asked if I thought uh, children should be allowed to transition. Now, I, I love the fact that this came up uh, during the Q&A because it shows where people's heads are. That question, uh, has really nothing to do with resolving the conflict between religious rights and or religious rights and liberties and LGBT rights and liberties. It's all about what's in this person's head about trans folks and at what point should they transition. And uh, the response that I gave was, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. What I should have said and added a little bit is, I'm not a doctor. I don't know if you're a doctor, but you're not their doctor and this is between them and their doctor why on earth should your sincere religious convictions and concerns take priority over a per person's private interactions with their doctors and control over their own body? The people there were by and large good people. My opponent was a good person. I liked him. And as, as I was pointing out earlier, there are people who are like, wow, that sounds like a fairly reasonable compromise right up until you actually consider the complexities and the consequences. And how many hoops are you going to make the LGBT community jump through in order for you to have your religious freedoms? Some points that weren't made during the debate, which, which definitely should have, but in, in the process of, of going through and answering questions and addressing all the various arguments, some things get overlooked. And, and that is that um, it's not like the LGBT community is running around saying, oh, we don't think straight marriage should exist. Well, all right, some of them do because some people are opposed to marriage in general. And some people think that the solution is for the government to get out of the marriage business entirely. That this, uh, this de facto recognition of marriage as the government does provides a, uh, a benefit that is either unnecessary or unfair or an unrealistic entanglement of the government with various religious ideas or personal views and that maybe uh, this should just all be handled by contract law and no, but there shouldn't be any marriage. But it's been around so long that uh, that's a not a particularly practical solution to just let's get rid of marriage. By and large, I was happy with the fact that we had the debate and that there were points that we're able to get out because just from, and it was a fairly small audience, a much smaller audience than we would normally get at one of these events. And it's because it was the first event in Austin, Sunday night, it was on campus, there was parking issues. You know, I came immediately after doing uh, an early episode of the atheist experience. So 
I don't know exactly what the solution is um, with regard to the optics. I think there's a case to be made that as a straight cis white guy defending the LGBT community's rights uh, in a full-throated way, trans rights are human rights, LGBT rights, uh, nobody's rights can be trumped because of your uh, opinions. You're allowed to have them, you're allowed to act on behalf of them, just like you're allowed to swing your fist around right up until the point where you're about to hit someone or, or enter their personal space. Um, the the specifics about the the cake case is really about the business license. That the guy who, who thought he had the gotcha in saying, ah, oh, you can't compel art. It's not about compelling art. It's about making sure that we have businesses that are open to the public that operate fairly and treat every member of the public equally. If you want to be a bigot, you can have a private club like the Boy Scouts or the men's only women suck cigar club uh, secretly hidden behind a door where you have to pay a membership fee to show what an unbelievable jackass you are. But if you're going to have a business that's open to the public and providing services to the public, it has to be equitable. Now, this is where we get into which classes are protected by the government. You know, uh, this class isn't protected, this class isn't protected. You know, but the real issue here is that rather than having protected classes, we should look at this as human beings. And human beings are the one and only true protected class. And so I would like to be able to marry the person I love, irrespective of what gender, if, if any, they happen to associate with. You would like the same. I'm not saying your marriage to someone uh, of, of another gender is invalid or disgusting or should not be allowed. And yet there are people who on behalf of their religious convictions are doing exactly that to the LGBT community. And it's monumentally frustrating, which is why I started the debate by changing LGBT to black to say, oh, this debate is about the conf how do we resolve conflicts between black rights and religious freedoms in order to illustrate to the people who were there that their visceral reaction to the notion that we were discussing what rights black people should have is exactly the same visceral reaction they should have to when we're discussing what rights the LGBTQ community should have. Um, it was, I watched the people in the audience as I was saying that, uh, I watched the ones who got angry and it wasn't, it's not like there were African Americans there who got angry that I used this particular thing. What it was is the people who really, really wanted to oppose LGBTQ rights were angry that I used an example that was so sharp because they recognize they're not going to be able to counter this. And that was the point of the debate. That was the reason that I did the debate, because there are people who are like, oh, we, we shouldn't be debating these things. And as far as should, I would agree. It would be very nice if we lived in a world where these things, uh, you know, it's not like we're going to have a debate on whether or not slavery should be allowed. But at one time, we did have those debates, and we had to have those debates, because that's how people change their minds about things. Because either you go to war, you come up with a compromise, which results in people being considered three-fifths of a person, or you engage in a debate and you have a discussion, and you get that information out to the public so that you can change minds. And you're not going to change every mind. There are always going to be bigots. But if you want to move towards normalcy, if you want to move towards these issues not being issues, you have to convince a significant portion of the population and get them to vote and act on behalf of those issues so that we can have a government that guarantees that everyone is treated equal. That everybody who wants to marry the person that they love or the person that they want a green card from or whatever their reason is, is allowed to actually do that. Because when we start talking about the sanctity of marriage, even if we don't mention religion, we're going down that route. There's nothing special, nothing sacred about marriage. The divorce rate, 50 some odd percent. Christians get divorced, atheists get divorced, 
Muslims get divorced, Buddhists get divorced, everybody gets divorced. And maybe if we didn't have people running around thinking their religious freedoms had primacy, that because they were listed first amongst the Bill of Rights, that they trump everything else, we would be able to have equality quicker. Because the second you think that if we list 10 rights, your preferred ones are more important than everybody else's, that's the thing that has to be attacked. And so uh, I did the debate. I'm happy I did the debate. I'm generally happy with the way it turned out. There were, there were some uh, pretty good moments in there where I think I made some good points. There were obviously some points that were missed. And hopefully in the future, much like I, I've done exactly one public debate on abortion, um, I probably won't do another public debate on LGBTQ rights. I will just point people to this video and encourage any event organizers that want to continue to have discussions or debates like this, uh, point them to my friends who are members of that community to say, I've already done this. Uh, I don't need to be the white knight coming in championing this in a debate structure. And if there's nothing new that's going to be presented in a debate, it would be a waste of everybody's time. Instead, point them to the debate I've already done and then point them to this book and this resource and this individual. And if somebody else wants to jump in and have this sort of discussion, then by all means, go for it. But if we're going to work towards a world where we all have true liberty and freedom, where we no longer have to worry about someone sounding reasonable when they oppose basic human rights, which is exactly what can happen, because we want to avoid conflict. And when you hear a nice person offer a compromise, it can sound reasonable if you don't realize what's at stake. Oh, well, it's fine. We can just hire more pharmacists and that. No, that's not always an option. It's not like these fights are happening, you know, in downtown New York where there's 10 pharmacies inside of a couple of blocks. These things are happening in small towns where the bigots get to win, where people have fewer options, where the power imbalance is such that you don't have any way to even hope to get your rights guaranteed because you are essentially alone. I grew up in some small towns. I grew up, I was, I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, but we moved out to Liberty and Kearney uh, and then I moved over to St. Charles, but we lived in the rural areas. We had four and a half acres that backed up to somebody else's 400 acres. You had to drive 15, 20 minutes to get to the grocery store or the pharmacy or whatever else you wanted. And I can't imagine what it would be like to get there, to get to a pharmacy and have a prescription and be told that they're not going to fill it. But that's your job. As long as it, the pre prescription from the doctor is appropriately filled out, is legal, is not dangerous, uh, your job is to fill that. It's never your job to say, well, it's against my sincere religious convictions to give you contraception. It's against my sincere religious convictions, uh, convictions to give you the hormones that have been prescribed. Um, that's between that person and their doctor. And if you're in a small town where there's one place that makes cakes, oh, well, it's a custom cake. You can buy any one of the regular cakes, but I'm not going to make you a custom cake because that's art. But if you're offering that service to the public, you have to offer that service to the public equally. It's a dangerous minefield walking into these debates because you run the risk of potentially pissing everybody off. There are people who are like, oh, this shouldn't be up for debate. And I agree with you because what you mean is we should be living in a world that is post-debate about what rights individuals have. We don't live in that world. And as the affected classes are too small to have a power base to necessarily change things, uh, and where we don't want to compromise on basic human rights, the last remaining option is to engage in education and debate. Debate being one of the many ways that you can educate people both on the facts and to counter arguments. Because let's imagine that I hadn't showed up that day. And instead of being at that venue, my opponent basically gave his opening remarks as a sermon to his church. And if he's got five or 600 people at his church and maybe they're recording it and it gets online, that's a one-way communication. That is somebody with a potential audience of millions posting videos online in a way that 
seems reasonable because there's nobody there to counter it. In a debate format, he gets to present his idea, and then I get to explain why it's a bad idea. That's exactly what happened. If you look through the comments, there are a number of people notice, noting it, saying, hey, I like this guy. I liked him too. Hey, he sounded pretty reasonable. I understand that. I understand how people can look at that and go, yeah, yeah that seems like a reasonable compromise. It's because we, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to put yourself in the position of the affected class, of the people who live in a small town, of the people who have no friends, of the people who've lost their families, who've lost their communities, all because of who they are and have society constantly trying to tell them, no, you don't count. My religious beliefs about who you are is so much more important than who you actually are and how we should treat you that I just win because I'm religious. That has to be countered. And the only options are to, like, he puts up a video and then maybe I put up a video. But it's much better if you can get us both in the same room having a back and forth. Because then, there, in the, in the arena of competitive ideas, you can make people aware of stuff. There were a number of people in that audience who learned a lot. How many minds were changed? I have no idea. How many people thought I, anything I said was reasonable? Well, at least two, because they told me. How much did this debate change the world? I don't know. I just think that, by and large, the world's going to be a better place with this sort of discussion in it until we get to the better place where these sorts of discussions seem completely absurd to everybody on almost every side. You're probably still going to find somebody who's willing to debate slavery of whether or not we should have it. But those, we're at a point where that's a vanishingly small portion of the population. And if the goal is to get to the point where the people who are opposed to LGBTQ rights are a vanishingly small portion of the population, we've got to make sure that we are working as activists to change laws, elect the people who are going to change laws, so that we have the full force of the government behind the protection of individuals' rights. And part of that process is fundamentally changing people's minds. How many vehemently anti-gay politicians completely flipped their view as soon as they found out their nephew or their niece was a member of that community? I've got a gay nephew. Oh, I guess maybe I, I should stop trying to prevent him from living his life to the fullest and being an equal citizen alongside everybody else. That's one way. But if you can't reach somebody with a, an emotional, personal connection, having these sorts of debates and discussions is probably the second best way of encouraging people to rethink their positions and start to work towards better goals. I want to end this with something interesting that happened. Now, I was raised a Southern Baptist. Um, I went to the First Baptist Church of Austin yesterday for a magic auction and they had a big poster. I posted a copy of it um, to Facebook and it surprised me because even I, despite knowing that there's differences between different religious organizations, when I think Baptist, I still think Southern Baptist. Uh, I don't think Free Will Baptist. I don't think Liberty Baptist. I don't think non or, um, unaffiliated Baptist, but they have a huge banner at their church. And it says, at this church, black lives matter. Church and state are separate. Disabled contributors are critical. Humans aren't illegal. LGBTQ love is love. Refugees are welcome. Religious freedom is respected. Science is real and art speaks truth. Women's rights are equal rights and all are responsible to the earth. Now, apart from the statement about art speaks truth, I don't really have any objection to that. As a matter of fact, I'm incredibly encouraged to see that sort of change. Once upon a time, if you saw a Baptist church, and, and I know there are tons of Baptist churches that would be up in arms about this particular message from this Baptist church. They'd be outraged. Oh, they're not true Christians. They're not following their Bible. And perhaps they're not following their Bible. But what they are following is the trend of recognition of humans as equal. The, the majority of the things that are on that huge banner, it's a 20 some odd foot banner hanging in the middle of, of, of like a, a foyer type area in the church. 
that banner isn't Christianity. That banner is, by and large, humanism. How is it that we got to a point where a massive Baptist church is now advocating for the foundational principles of humanism, despite what the Bible says, despite what the tradition and orthodoxy related to their religion say, it wasn't because of government imposition to try to force them to change their beliefs. It wasn't because of conflict and fighting or anything along those lines. It was about education and it was about having debates and discussions about those topics. The world is getting better. And if we want it to continue and we want it to speed up to the point where we can deal with other issues and basic human rights and the rights of the LGBTQ community are no longer really a subject of even interest. You know, I don't know how much time anybody else has spent discussing long dead ideas that aren't held by any significant portion of the population. But we have to keep having the discussions and debates like this. And hopefully, um, hopefully I'll get agreement from the people whose rights I was there to try to defend uh, the ideas and principles of humanism that I was advocating and that people will pick this apart and say, ah, that was a mistake, that was a mistake. Oh, we need to be saying this, we need to be saying this. Because if you're going through that debate and saying, here's every little mistake that Matt made, what you're doing is saying, this needs to be done better. This was good, it was okay, whatever. It needs to be done better because you recognize the importance and the value of changing people's minds. It's the reason that I do what I do. It's the reason why I volunteer to do debates like this so that we can get more information out and so that people like my opponent and the people in his church who think they've come up with a reasonable compromise are forced to rethink their position to say, well, how would I feel about my compromise if I were one of a part of that affected class or that affected community? Debates have value. We're not going to fix the world in a heartbeat. But we have to have those discussions. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.